Hey everybody, welcome. This is Mr. V and welcome to AP Daily Live Review for AP Environmental Science. Uh, this is video number eight. This is our last video. So as you know, I'm Mr. Villarreal or Mr. V from Mission, Texas at Sheridan Advanced Academic Academy. Um, go Rattlers, go Cobras. And so let's go ahead and jump into this last presentation, right? Okay, so welcome. Let's go ahead and uh, jump in. What are we gonna learn today? Today, uh, this is our last video, number eight. So in this video, we're going to be using this time to try to answer and clarify some final questions and concepts from video seven. So I'm going to try to do a bunch of those today. Um, we're going to make sure to conduct a brief overview of the content for unit nine for global change. That's our last unit. Um, and then we're going to discuss any visual representations, um, and I misspelled that, sorry about that, <laughs> and uh, multiple choice uh, and free response strategies we can do. And um, we're going to be modeling some more free response today. So I know that's something that you guys like uh, from these videos. And I'm going to do my best to cover one more free response question to help you all out. Um, and then we're going to also go over some final tips and hints for the AP test, which by now, if you've been watching all these videos, you guys are pros and you're going to be fine. So, um, and then of course, we'll wrap up with some questions uh, to help you out and some live practice um, to wrap the whole thing up. Okay, so beginning here, and I want to apologize first. If you see me get a little sniffly, I apologize. I'm a little runny today. Um, but if there's any uh, video questions and clarifications, let's go through. I got a whole bunch of them. So let's see. Um, the first is if the test asks for a question from an experiment, can you make it a statement? And um, will you have to write formulas? That was from one student. And so it depends. If the question asks for a research question, then probably keep it that way as a question. If they ask you to make a claim, then a statement should work. You shouldn't probably put that as a question. Um, so make sure that's clear. And then of course for formulas, you can write either the words or the formulas out. Just don't overwrite. And what I mean by that is, you know, there've been questions in the past where if you look right here, that's carbonic acid, H2CO3. That it should be um, with the subscript of AQ instead of liquid. And that does get counted wrong, even though the equation itself may be right. You did make sure you don't, try to overwrite and overthink it. And then how will the timing for the FRQs work? Um, so for that one, you're going to get an hour and 10 minutes. The digital app is going to have a timer on there and it will let you know, I believe when there's five minutes left, you have to make sure to check the digital app and download it to make sure you try it out. Um, and then of course, if you're testing in, in person in a couple of weeks, that's going to have a proctor letting you know, uh, at least usually a 10 minute warning and then, um, if you can ask, you can always ask for more from the person proctoring your exam. But of course, as always, do the easiest parts first to give yourself more time at the end, no matter what your situation, and refer to the testing websites and digital app, which we'll show you in a minute. Um, that way you can get more information on that. And then can you explain part F from yesterday's FRQ? So that was from Rance, and yes, we can. So the question was, petroleum has many uses as a raw material for consumer goods. Identify one substitute for petroleum in a specific consumer product other than fuel. Well, petroleum has been used to make products like plastic, right? So the examples were given on there as replacing plastic products. So you know, instead of, they said to use plant-based bottles or plant-based plastic, they said to use bamboo, versus um, plastic containers, or to use cotton instead of uh, plastic and nylon portions in your, uh, in your clothing and stuff like that. So that's what it meant by those. And then are there common solutions that we need to memorize? Like, is there an easy way to get through an FRQ? Um, not always. The solution is going to vary, right? But there are going to be common problems. So remember, think HIPCO from yesterday. Um, that's in the case of environmental issues, right? Those are going to be what happens to a species or what happens in the event of an environmental problem. And then of course, um, when you're thinking about the problems of uh, economic, make sure you put something about money and jobs uh, when you see that term there. So that's, that's gonna be how to look at those. And then Tiffany from New York, you asked a, a bunch of questions. I'm so glad, thank you, because I wanted to ask answer as many as I could on this last video. And does rounding matter was one. Should you uh, should we label the answers to the FRQ parts that you write? And can we uh, estimate answers on identifying numbers? And so let's go through those. So the first one was, yes, you can round, but don't over round. Like, don't try to make it something where it's just a whole number every time. Um, try to keep it to a certain number of decimals that are given to you. So if you're given a couple decimals, keep it to that way. We don't look for sig figs on the test. 
but it is important to try to make sure you don't over round and get out of the range. And that matters more for FRQs. Uh, your second question, should you label your answers? Please, please do. The people who are grading your tests, um, if they just see one giant block of text, it's going to be very um, uh, difficult to get through that and make sure that they can read through those points. They do their best and they're going to do their best to get through it, but you make life a lot easier for us to find your points if you simply label A1 and then answer it, A2 and then answer it. That would be great. And then the third one, is there always a range accepted? Um, that, it, what's the range of answers for identifying and estimating? On FRQs, they have a range, okay? So try to stay close to as, as close to the main number that you can, because if you fall out of that range, then you won't get that answer. So please make sure you keep that in mind. Okay, and then carrying on with some more questions. Um, real quick, I, I've gotten this like three or four times. I want to make sure I get it out there so we're clear. You don't have to memorize anything more than the metric system. So if you're worried about, do I need to know um, how to convert from like a joule to a watt to a BTU? No. You will need to know the metric system and how a kilojoule works versus a kilowatt uh, compared to those watts and joules. So know how to convert within the metric system, but you don't have to know how to convert between random things. And we're going to show you a math example in just a moment. And then can you ever watch the exam? Yes, definitely. Make sure that you keep track of your time. As long as the watch does not connect to the internet, if it's a smart watch, that should not be allowed. Okay. Um, what is the difference in an oligotrophic and eutrophic? That was from our question, our FRQ, I believe, or no, that was from our notes uh, yesterday. And so real quick, oligotrophic bodies of water have less nutrients, but they're more stable. And uh, eutrophic have very high nutrients that tend to be very unstable and those can lead to those dead zones that we mentioned. Um, and then can you show us more math? I, I definitely got several of those. So here's a very brief, quick example of how to use dimensional analysis. So let's look at that, right? Now, here's what they would give you on a free response. They will tell you how much a hectare is equal to acres, and then how much an acre is equal to yards. So you don't need to know this. I didn't know this. I had to go look this up. So you don't need to memorize it. You just need to know how to do the math. Now, here's a brief scenario. This is not a real AP question, but it is a brief scenario to help you practice. A local school is planning on reforesting an area of 6,464 square yards. They intend to write a grant, but they need to give the value in hectares. Calculate how many hectares this reforested area would be. So for this, remember for dimensional analysis, this is how I tell my students to do it. You take your given amount, and you convert it by looking at the unit that you want on top and the unit you already have on the bottom. And in this case, you probably need to do multiple steps. And again, you do the same thing, the unit you want and then that unit that you have on top. And of course, the answer is going to be in the final unit that you want. Okay, so let's look at how this would go. This one would be beginning with the number they found in square yards, which is 6,464. And then we convert that from yards to acres. Okay, so we take our yards, our put, put that on the bottom and our acres up top. And then we take that and multiply it by our next conversion unit, which would be acres on top, on bottom and hectares on top. Once you do the math here, what you're basically doing mathematically is you're dividing this number by the numbers on the bottom and multiplying it by the numbers on top. Since the numbers are on top are just one, you're good to go. Now, what's important here, and I'm gonna move to my pen here briefly, is that what happens is the yards cancel with each other and the acres cancel, giving us our answer in hectares. Now, one thing I wanna make a note, if you're looking at this and you're like, oh my gosh, another thing I have to learn? No, if you're not comfortable with dimensional analysis, don't do it, you don't have to. You can just show me 6464 divided by 4840, and then take that answer and divide it by 2.47. And that is totally fine. Do not feel like you need to go off and learn more dimensional analysis and go to uh, go online and start searching for dim dimensional analysis videos. Focus right now on the AP environmental science. You're close to the test. Don't worry so much about the math. If you know how to do this, great. If you don't know, it's not the end of the world. So don't freak out, okay? So. Brief information about the exam since our last video, I want to make sure we go over these. There will be three administrations, one in May 14th, that's the paper and pencil one, that's going to be in school at 12 p.m. local time, that's important. 
The digital test first round will be on May 27th, and that's going to be 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you have to select your time zone and take it at the same time as everyone else. That's online and can be at home or in school. And then on June 11th, that's going to be the third and final time to take the exam. That's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, digital either at home or in school. So don't forget those, whichever your date may be. And then, of course, don't forget, it's a full length exam. It's going to be multiple choice, first section, 80 questions, hour and a half. 60% of that score is going to come from the multiple choice. There will be individual questions, standalone. There's going to be quantitative sets looking at practice five mostly and others with three to four questions. Other practice sets with qualitative data, three to four questions primarily looking at practice two and one, four, and seven. And of course, our text-based resources, uh, those are new questions. If you'd like to go over more of those, we did go over those on Tuesday's video, which was video number eight, seven, six, right? Six, <laughs> sorry, I got backwards there. And those are new, so please make sure you look at those examples. And then, of course, um, some other brief examples about, or some other brief information about the free response is that it uh, doesn't matter which type of test you're taking, you will have three questions, hour and 10 minutes. Those will end up covering 40% of your exam score. And starting with the design investigation, analyzing an environmental problem and solution, and analyzing problem with a solution, and doing calculations. And remember, you do and have the option to use a four-function calculator. Um, not required of you, but uh, you can and are able to as long as it's not connected to the internet as well. And then some other just brief specifics about the digital exam, since we are getting closer. Um, and this is our last video, is remember to take it on a school-managed Chromebook or on a desktop or a laptop computer. No phones or tablets are allowed for that. Device should be connected to the internet and have power. It will also not allow you to go backwards. So remember, we've talked about this a couple of times. Make sure you look at your digital app for practice on that. And of course, it's not going to include internet searchable questions, or at least it shouldn't have that many available ones. And it will have other security features to please make sure you read your testing guide. And it will be reviewed for plagiarism detection. And it will also be looked at to identify any collaboration or unauthorized aids. So, and of course, it will not have any handwritten responses. So don't take any pictures of the work and try to turn it in. It'll need to be typed in, including the math. So if it's easier to type in math questions or math answers with um, separate steps instead of dimensional analysis, that's fine. Don't get bogged down in the format, okay? Then um, some other helpful links, we've talked about these before. So please review these before your exam. Um, exam dates and times are gonna be located here on all AP exams. Then you'll be able to see uh, information about our exam, the AP environmental one specifically here. And then of course, the digital exam information is gonna be at this testing guide. So please check that link. And of course, if you have not yet downloaded the testing app, please do so you can practice. Um, it does have sample questions and a little bit of a sample uh, setup, so you'll know exactly how that will go. And this is our last session, so we won't be able to answer questions during feedback, but if there is anything you'd like to say to myself or to Ms. Bagley, please send us some feedback. It'd be great to hear from you all. Um, and to see if these things helped you out, if you needed, uh, if there was uh, more that you, we could have done, or if we did everything you, you dreamed of, that'd be great. We'd love to hear from you. Um, this will remain open for another day or two, um, but unfortunately, we won't be able to get back to you on that. So um, if you'd just like to leave a, a comment or two, that'd be great. So let's review the content of Unit 9, right? Unit 9 is going to be about global change. And so there's going to be a lot of stuff, and it's the big picture items. This is going to be basically the culmination of the entire course. So make sure you're, um, you're focused on this unit and that you've gone over a lot of it. Uh, so we start with the ozone layer. That's going to be that layer of O3 that's up in the stratosphere, and it's protecting us from harmful UV rays. And that uh, has been broken down a little bit over the years with chlorofluorocarbons, right, CFCs. Those are refrigerants and propellants used uh, with anthropogenic means, and it did deplete the ozone layer. And the main chemical there was the chloro portion, the chlorine. And it can also, the ozone layer can also be depleted naturally with ice crystals melting in, Arctic, in Antarctic spring. 
And of course, UV rays can reach the surface uh, because of this, and the decreased ozone can cause skin cancer and cataracts uh, for humans as well. So how do we reduce that depletion? The only real big way to do this is to replace those ozone depleting chemicals like CFCs with a substitute that will not deplete ozone. And you can use things like a hydrofluorocarbon that takes out the chlorine, but unfortunately both chlorofluoro and hydrofluorocarbons are both considered uh, greenhouse gases. So here's a brief look at what that does. So there's the ozone layer, and that remember is up in the stratosphere. Remember there's two big layers to note, the stratosphere and the troposphere. Stratosphere is gonna be where you end up uh, blocking the UVC 100%, it's going to block 95% of UVB and only 5% of UVA. So um, the less you have of ozone, the more UVB will get in, and that's going to cause uh, skin cancer and cataracts uh, through that. Okay. And then carrying on here. So now we look at the greenhouse effect. This is going to be the precursor to climate change. So there's several gases responsible, and some of these you may know, and some of these you may not have heard of, but uh, water is actually a greenhouse gas. It's a, um, a vapor and it can be a short residence time um, gas. Excuse me. Carbon dioxide is the one that's probably your primary actor here. It's the most abundant, so we see that often. And then of course you have methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. Now one thing I do want to point out is as you go down this list, these have a higher what's called the global warming potential. That potential goes up as you go down this list. So water vapor, not a lot of global warming potential. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> and then chlorofluorocarbons have the most um, global warming potential. So, um, and then of course, the reason we focus so much on carbon dioxide is because it is currently the most abundant of these gases. So increases in greenhouse gases have been found. Um, and that's what it does is it's going to trap more infrared radiation or heat. And that's going to lead to all sorts of environmental problems, which we're going to get in depth tonight a little bit. And that's going to be rising sea levels. That's going to be uh, disease vectors being able to spread more because of climate change. And of course, the big picture of global climate change itself, connecting all these other issues. So it's important to note what happens here. If you look at the diagram, um, our greenhouse gases, like our nitrous oxide, methane, carbon dioxide, and uh, chlorofluorocarbons, these things, normally you get radiation either reflected back, okay, or absorbed depending on what we have. So we have a bunch of absorbed energy from man-made sources, but much of it gets reflected back from the lighter surfaces, you know, sandy beaches, water, sometimes um, ice caps, things like that. Well, greenhouse gases act as a barrier and cause this radiated heat to bounce back to the surface. And multiple times, and that stays longer, which means the Earth is going to get warmer to that. So that's because these chemicals kind of serve as a, a mesh layer, preventing it from just leaving right away. And so continuing on with that, climate change is going to be our big deal. So this is going to take the big bulk of what we're talking about. And of course, the Earth has had periods of warm and cool. So that is normal. Um, the current trend right now, though, is going to be to warming because of that increase in CO2. This is leading to rising temperatures. It's leading to melting permafrost up in the tundra and taiga and poles. And sea ice is melting currently as well. And all of that ice melting has been leading to rising sea levels, which is a, a phenomenon we're already seeing. And of course, we have coastal po populations being displaced because of that rising sea level. Now, here's the catch though, I will say this, not everything is negative. There are gonna be some positive developments with climate change. So for example, some ecosystems are going to be able to expand, right? Um, the ocean expansion is gonna help and rising sea levels is gonna help certain locations do that. Although downside is formerly areas that were shallow might now be too deep and not get light. So still kind of sad face, sorry. <laughs> um, and then of course, with the heat exchange, with the heating of the world, you're going to end up with exchange of that being uh, altered, and that's going to that may alter your um, Hadley cells in your jet stream. So please refer back to your Earth Science unit on that one, which is Unit Four, right? Yeah. And so there, there's you're going to have you're going to have coastal flooded areas that were not typically flooded may start to flood more. So consider that uh, as one of our problems with climate change. 
And then over here, um, we continue with that. Climate change is a big, expansive, pro expansive problem. And it begins and ends a little bit with the ocean conveyor belt. So we'll look at that in a moment. But that conveyor belt, along with winds, sends warmth from the equator to the north and the south poles. That allows for the um, world to end up having temperate temperatures and not freezing and then suddenly uh, hot the equator. So that's a big help. But that's going to be affected by climate change. And so is soil. You typically get questions, maybe in the free response, about how soil might cause changes in, or how soil might be changed by the cause of climate change. And that's going to be due to the fact that you're going to end up uh, with more erosion because of rainfall, temperature is going to change the chemistry of the soil and bring out certain ions. So that's going to be a big deal that we can talk about uh, in a question like that. And then, of course, you have polar regions that are going to be affected by climate change uh, much faster. And the, track, the trick is those places, because they are lighter, tend to reflect heat back into space. But when they're gone, the Earth will absorb more. So that's going to be what we call a positive feedback loop. Not that it's positive that it happens, but that it keeps the problem happening, right? And methane is going to be another one here. As the ice melts in the tundra, there is going to be methane trapped in that is going to be released. And as we saw previously, methane has much more global warming potential than CO2. So you're going to end up continuing the loop, and that's a positive feedback loop. And of course, the ecosystem is going to suffer as well. You're going to have organisms that you know, need to have uh, snow or ice to survive, like polar bears and seals, that won't be able to because it won't be available, and they'll have lost habitat and food to that as well. And so here's our ocean conveyor belt. We saw this. We talked a little bit about those, pa those plastic garbage patches that can form due to those. Well, not only is this uh, responsible for transferring heat from that equator to the northern latitudes, but it can also end up shutting off with too much uh, fresh water pouring into it. So that can tip the balance of those. So something important to be thinking about um, when it comes to climate change. And then um, also with this, of course, with climate change, you're also going to get ocean warming. So not only is the planet getting warmer, but so is the ocean. And that's going to have all sorts of impact on the species inside. The habitat will be lost. They're going to have metabolic changes. They're going to have reproductive changes. And you're also going to get coral bleaching. Okay. So coral is a mutualistic relationship. And if they lose their algae, they're going to turn white and then eventually die. Okay. And this is caused by that constant warming of the sea surface. So as you can see, sea surface temperatures um, from the 1901 to 2000 range have generally been increasing the whole time. Okay, so whether you're near the equator and the latitudes uh, in the um, tropics, or uh, if you're looking at the entire area besides the uh, poles, it's gotten much warmer. And the poles themselves have gotten even more warmer, even more warm than the rest of the, the planet. And so acidification is going to also occur at this time. That's where you get pH drops because of uh, increased CO2 in the water. So here's an example of an equation you might need to write a couple years back. This was an equation students had to write. Now you can put this in words, right? With more carbon dioxide, the excess ends, to, uh, ends up combining with water to make more carbonic acid. Um, remember, if you try to put too much or try to... Um, put something that's incorrect, then you will, lot, you will lose points on something like that. So if you're not comfortable writing the chemical formula, then don't. Okay. And of course, the, the corals are going to be blocked from making calcium carbonate, and that's going to end up leading, and that's going to be a cause, uh, an effect, excuse me, of the cause of uh, ocean acidification. And so this is what coral reefs will end up looking like. And then from there, other anthropogenic activities, this is all caused uh, by an increase in carbon dioxide with our activities of, number one, combustion of fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels will then release emissions, too, from our vehicles. Um, you'll have deforestation, and so that's going to bring down the CO2 that could have been stored away. So carrying on here with our last couple bits here, don't forget about invasive species. Some species can uh, live and thrive outside their normal habitat, and that's sometimes beneficial, but it can also be harmful if it threatens natives, right, native species. And so that tends to be typically the generalists uh, that are invasive. And those generalists tend to also be our selected species. So they can outcompete those case-selected native species, typically. 
And of course, we have to use human intervention to try to control or eradicate those species. Otherwise, we will end up um, letting them kind of take over and that's when species can become endangered instead, okay? So an endangered species is gonna be those that either their numbers have dropped or um, you know, they've, they're basically very close to extinction. And there are several factors that may cause this, right? So first is that they are extensively hunted. So that over exploitation can be a main factor. That they have a very limited diet, okay? They only will eat certain types of food native to their habitat or that invasive species outcompete them and have defeated where they live. Um, and then of course, these species have to adapt to those changes to avoid being endangered or extinct. And so those selective pressures may end up working and be too much on the species if that happens. And of course, the other things that are gonna affect them are gonna be competition for resources uh, like territory, food, mates, habitat. Um, that can lead to push, to push them to uh, endangered or extinction. And then of course, you can uh, stop this stuff by protecting them. You can either criminalize poaching, protect habitats, legislation can stop these things. And we'll talk about some of those today too. So species like elephants and pandas are pretty famous for those. Um, and they have different uh, characteristics that have led them to be um, more likely to be endangered. So then from here, um, we have to talk about human impacts, right? Our, bio, our activities have impacted biodiversity quite a bit as well. So um, I mentioned HIPCO at the beginning, and that's what this means. HIPCO is going to be our main factor. So if they ask you a question about how are humans impacting biodiversity, you can answer with one of these choices. And sometimes, and you can't just pick one. It has to be specific to the species and situation. So you can have habitat destruction, that's H. Uh, I is invasive species. Uh, first P is population. That's our population being around. Um, then pollution, and then of course, climate change, and then over exploitation or over hunting can be a big factor as well. Um, and of course, what's the big deal with all these? The first one, a good example is gonna be habitat fragmentation. So these large habitats can get broken down into smaller ones and those roads, pipelines, things like that, they're gonna prevent species from being able to mix or even move to their uh, normal ranges, okay? And of course, every species can respond differently to these, to these fragmentations. Um, and of course, how big that fragmentation is. If it's one road, it may not have as big of an impact as you know, a multi-level highway or something like that. Um, and then of course, climate change is gonna be a big one because if the um, you know, precipitation changes, the sea level changes or the temperature, those are gonna be major factors on whether or not that uh, habitat can survive or the individual species can survive in that habitat. And then of course, we have to try to mitigate it. Remember mitigate means to slow the problem down. To do this, we need to either create protected areas, we can uh, create habitat corridors, or we can have sustainable use practices to restore those previous habitats. Okay. And here's an example, right? So if you have a winding road like this, you've cleared a large swath of space and now, unfortunately, you, not only does the species have to get across the road, but they have to get across this open area. And most species will not do that willingly, or at least not um, very successfully. Okay. And then um, now we're going to talk about some of the legislation. So either legislations or treaties that might work and go well with climate change uh, or global change in some of these discussions. So the first one's gonna be uh, the CITES Treaty. That's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Uh, basically that's an international treaty that has, uh, that's protecting trade in endangered species and plants and animals. So it says what you should and should not be able to trade and it lays down those guidelines and the countries that sign that treaty have to abide by that. The Montreal Protocol, was signed in, I believe, 1980. And that was the treaty that uh, phased out chlorofluorocarbons and the production of ozone depleting substances. Now the Kyoto Protocol is another treaty international that was proposed in 1992 and um, was not ratified by the United States. So this was kind of the precursor to the modern day Paris uh, Treaty or Paris Accord, uh, but that was not agreed to in 1992. So good thing to note on that one. And then of course the Endangered Species Act was, is a United States law or legislation that ends up setting criteria for us as a nation to label a species endangered or threatened and protect them 
and their habitats. So when you see stuff like habitat, habitat restoration or protected areas, those may fall under the Endangered Species Act. So today, what science practices are we going to look at? Remember that there are seven science practice total. The College Board expects us to demonstrate these, not know them off the top of our head. The first one is concept explanation, then visual representations, text analysis, scientific experiments, data analysis, math routines, and environmental solutions. That's a big one that you're going to see a lot in these back half of the units. And of course, these practices can be assessed in any unit, and any unit can be assessed with these practices, but some of them are going to be lent more to others. So today we're going to be looking at concept explanation, uh, visual representations, and of course, uh, environmental solutions. So let's look at an easy example to start off, right? Let's, uh, let's get ourselves a little warmed up. Okay. So with our multiple choice, which of the following is a greenhouse gas that is also a byproduct of anaerobic respiration? So the choices are methane, they are nitrogen, N2, they are oxygen, O2, and they are hydrogen sulfide, H2S. So what I want to point out here is sometimes these questions are not as bad as they seem, right? You can ask yourself and go, all right, what's it asking for? Number one, it's asking for a greenhouse gas. What are the processes that it's mentioning? So it's greenhouse gases and, of course, anaerobic respiration. And then what do each of these gases do? So we know for sure that um, when we're looking for a greenhouse gas, that's not going to be nitrogen and oxygen. Those are your primary gases in the atmosphere. They're 71% nitrogen or 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. So now you're left with thinking about methane or hydrogen sulfide. And so you ask yourself, which one's coming out of a by, as a byproduct of respiration? Okay, so hydrogen sulfide is not one of those. That's actually going to be methane. So there you have it. And I want you to think about that because sometimes it's just that easy, guys. Good job, right? So if you're looking at that and you paused it and you were like, methane, before you even said anything, then you got this, right? And so looking at that multiple choice, what were the practice we were assessing, right? Or practices? Well, that's an easy one. That's a concept one. So don't feel like just because we're in unit eight and nine and we're talking about these later units, don't feel like, oh, well, they're all going to be really tough. Sometimes they're going to put questions like that. That's not out of the scope. So, you know, do your best, be mindful, pay attention, and don't let that get out of your way. And of course, to look back at some of these other uh, gases, uh, you can look at topic 1.4 for your AP Daily videos. And now let's practice the free response question, our last one, right? Whew, let's get to it. So free response, the sample number two type. So now we're talking about piping plovers, right? Great little pretty bird. And the piping plover is a globally threatened species with about as few as 2,000 nesting pairs remaining in the Atlantic of these migratory shorebirds. Plovers were nearly hunted to extinction in the 19th century. So plovers prefer to nest and search for food on open sandy beaches between sparsely vegetated sand dunes. Washovers, where sand is washed up from the beach and buries vegetated areas during storms, are also important to plovers because they provide uh, moist and undisturbed habitats for adults and their chicks. Ecologists with the Elliott uh, Oceanographic Institute mapped the distribution of plover nests during two seasonal surveys of nesting sites over a 10-year period on uh, Assateague Island, if I say that right. This is a barrier island along near, a long narrow island running parallel to the Atlantic coast of Virginia. So if you're from Virginia, hopefully you've seen this. And so there it is, the numbers in 1999 and 2009. So remind yourself, it's a practice two type because this is going to involve skills. The skills for this are going to be looking at visuals and understanding what's happening. So like a graph, instead of looking at the axes and stuff like this, you have to look at it. Okay, what does this mean? So we're looking at unvegetated sand and that's where most of those dots are. Here, if you look at it over here, that's the same thing. So before we even get to the question part, we're starting to see a pattern. So always do that. I know this is a lot of information. And you look at this and you're like, oh my God, so much words. You know, can I just skip this question? Well, if you're on paper and this is too much, then yes, you may skip it and go to another one. But if you're digital, you're going to have to stick with it, guys. You're going to have to watch it, make sure you're on it, on it and answer it. So train yourselves now. Um, make sure you've read this, make sure you're ready for the question parts. Okay. And then over here, here's some of the questions. Use the maps to answer the following questions. 
identify the preferred nesting habitat for piping plovers, describe the change in the number of piping plover nests on Astig Island between 99 and 09, and describe one likely reason for the change in the number of piping plover nests between 99 and 09. And then the coastal species are affected more than just by natural events. So special beach restrictions can help piping plovers during nesting season. Describe one restriction that could reasonably be implemented to help prevent the destruction of plover nests by humans. And in addition to providing habitat, barrier islands are important for other reasons. Explain one way that these features help preserve, preserve and protect the environment in coastal regions. And then identify one human action that directly threatens coastal habitats and describe one impact on species other than the piping plover. Then it gives you more information. There's always going to be that little step or that transition in between where that gives you more. So don't be afraid to answer some questions and then see the rest. So read through the whole thing and decide where you sit on this. And so it says approximately 40% of the U.S. population resides in coastal areas, such as near Assateague Island, where uh, sea level rise and shoreline or erosion is occurring. Identify one economic impact on coastal communities that has resulted from rising sea levels. Describe two methods that may be used to locally protect communities, coastal communities from rising sea levels. Oh, whew, right? Like that's a lot, a lot of reading. So the prompt had a lot of reading with the visual, and so did the question. So now we got to get to it and break it down. But that's why I always ask you to look at the picture or the diagram first and see if you can tell the story. If you can tell the story before you even read the question, I promise you, you're going to probably give yourself the answer to one or two points. So here we're looking at um, the nesting sites again, and it says identify the preferred nesting habitat for piping plovers, describe the change in number uh, on the island between 99 and 09, and describe one likely reason for a change in the number. So right here, let's start with one. So one and two, it's all identify, describe. And so for A1, the obvious answer is that it's unvegetated sand. So we've talked about this the other day. If some of you were asking, can we answer a question in one word? In this case, possibly yes. Well, not one word, but it's still unvegetated sand. So one phrase. Um, so that would be helpful there. And you can say uh, sandy areas or washovers as well, because that's how they described it in the paragraph at the beginning. And then finally, for number two, you got to take a look. That's going to require you to do some counting because it says the change in the number of piping plover nests on the island between 99 and 09. So always give a number just to make sure. So here, once you count those, uh, those dots, you're going to see that there was uh, a change from 44 to 25 nesting sites instead. And um, that was 19 more nests in 1999. Sorry about that. Got a typo there. Um, than 2009. And of course, you can say there was a decrease in unvegetated sandy areas for letter three, because that's the reason for the change. And that's what occurred. Um, or you could say there's an increase in more vegetation and revegetation. So while that's good for some species, for others, it may not be. Okay. Now, some extra help for this for AP Daily would be looking at topic 2.6 and at topic 8.2 will help you out some. Then when you get over here, to your example two, your second portions is going to be letter B. Coastal species are affected more than by than just natural habitat, natural events. Um, and then special restrictions can help piping plovers describe one restriction that could reasonably be implemented. And then in addition to providing habitat for plovers, bear islands are important for other reasons. Explain one way that these features help preserve and protect environment in coastal regions. And identify a human action that directly threatens coastal habitats and describe one impact on species other than the piping plover that use the habitat. So right here, the first thing is you can say, um, how could you um, have a restriction on here? Well, you need to put warning signs, right? Post a warning sign, either a fence or a barrier over the nesting area, or you can also limit recreation on the beach where there are nests found. Okay, so that's an easy way and you have to describe so you can't just say post a barrier, you have to say what that barrier is going to do as well to get that point. For part two here, they block wind and waves from eroding beaches. So those barrier islands, they end up stopping those wa that water and that wind from breaking down the mainland coast. And they also create wetland ecosystems for other species like fish turtle, fish and turtles, okay, not fish turtles. <laughs> um, 
And then for number three, economics. So remember, it's asking us um, um, for B3, excuse me, identify a human action that's going to cause that and describe uh, how that's going to affect other species. Well, tourism and recreation on that area. So it's asking for the human action. So it's not an economic question so much, but just a, a human portion that's going to end up affecting those species. Okay. And so that's our tourism, our recreation, our development on the coast, of course, littering, drilling for oil, and uh, commercial fishing in that area. Okay. Sorry, went off screen there. Okay. And of course, for tourism, you have to, it says, identify and describe. So for tourism, you have to say that people can step on the nest, they can disrupt with their vehicles, or the bringing of sunscreen, it turns out to be toxic to uh, organisms. And then, of course, you can say for human development, that's going to lose habitat completely. So instead of revegetating, you could end up uh, destroying the entire ecosystem. Um, and of course, food waste and other predators might, food waste might attract other predators. And of course, oil drilling, oil spills may be toxic or coat species, as we spoke about yesterday. And commercial fishing is going to be either dredging or trawling. That's where you drag nets um, and over harvest, um, disrupting the food chains of the piping plover. Okay. And so if you look right here, even though we're talking about unit nine and we're getting into the later portions of the FRQ, there's still going to be some practice one stuff. So they are going to ask you for some of that, and they are going to include some of those solutions later too. Okay, so looking at here, identify an economic impact on coastal communities that's resulted in rising sea levels, from rising sea levels. Describe two methods that might be used locally to protect coastal communities from rising sea levels. And so looking at it right here, an economic impact right there, look at all these answers, money and jobs, decrease of tourist revenue, that's money, decrease of property value, more money, decrease of uh, damage to the property or land. So that's money as well, money related, increase to insurance costs, right? Uh, loss of aquaculture operations, those are jobs and money. And then of course, for letter D, what are two methods so you can give a couple of these that would locally protect uh, coastal communities, you could say, well, you could raise the structures to make sure that things don't end up getting damaged on the surface. You can move the structure back and get it away from the beach, or you can install pumps whenever there's flooding so that there's no uh, collection of water and uh, flooding of the area for habitat. Or you can also build seawalls or what are called um, uh, groins as well and jetties. Those can act as a barrier to protect that area from wave action. So you see right here, we're still identifying and we're describing, but look here, we're looking at practice seven, okay? So when you're looking at these and you give these choices, remember, you should always give your first couple uh, when it says describe two or describe one, give your best one first, whatever you find to be best. And just remember, take a breath, guys. You, you got this. You're at that point. You, you're okay, right? Um, and then, of course, our um, uh, at practices that we were assessing here, what do we have, right? Practices one, right? Concept explanation, practice two, which is going to be your uh, visual representations, and practice three, your environmental solutions. And again, if you feel like this was something with a topic that you were not sure about, um, you can go back and look at topics 9.5 and 9.10. So with that, what should we take away from this final video here? The first things to think about are some things to remember, of course. Number one is don't forget you need to practice those topics and the skills together. It's important to use the AP Daily content videos where they're there for help. And these videos as well will also be here on YouTube, but they'll also be housed on AP Classroom. So um, if you're seeing this here and you'd rather see it on AP Classroom to study and practice, or you teachers would like to assign to your students, you can assign uh, these. The first four are already up, the next four will be soon. That's this week's. And as you work your way through an FRQ, remember, look at what you're expected to know with how you're supposed to show it and use those practices to guide you. And of course, consider where those environmental legislation uh, sections go, right? They might ask it, they might not, it might be a free response, it might be a multiple choice, but look for those context clues. That's going to give you an advantage when, you, when you're trying to earn those points. And remember some key takeaways here, right? Number one is you have this, you're good, you got this, okay? Read everything you need, right? Make sure for the multiple choice, know what's being asked of you 
and for both the free response and the multiple choice, read everything and answer everything. That is the most important thing. Okay. And I just want to rem remind you, you have got this. You've got this. You're going to be fine. And of course, if you'd like to practice one more time, uh, we do have these cahoots available to you. Um, so you can use this link below to test your knowledge of Unit 9. So there's our Kahoot challenge for this last day. Um, and you can see how well you do compare and practice going with this uh, video. And you can see the previous Kahoot links and the guided notes. So Miss Bagley has uploaded her guided notes for last week's video. And I'll be uploading some guided notes for this week's videos um, probably over the weekend and next week. So keep an eye out for those. And then, of course, if you'd like to give us some feedback and let us know how we did and how these were helpful or just how you're doing, these will be open for a couple more days. You can do that as well. So um, I do want to say one last time, thank you very much. I'm glad you tuned in. I hope this has been helpful and good luck on your AP test whenever that may be.